Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to welcome everybody to our worldwide teaching on climate. This is uh, only one part of many, many, many worldwide teachings uh, across the globe. Uh, so this is uh, Indiana University's sort of attempt at trying to bring some information out to the public. And uh, our, our theme is take a bite out of hunger. I'm here with a variety of graduate students in the sustainability field, uh, the assistant director of the center uh, of the Civil Rights Heritage Center, George Garner, and uh, adjunct professor in sustainability, Krista Bailey. Uh, my name is Adrian Pacheco. I'm a uh, outreach coordinator with the uh, Center for a Sustainable Future. And I mean, in my, my work, I, I know it's hard to get people excited about sustainability, to get people to come out and participate. So I'm happy to welcome our audience online and in person. Um, and with that, I'll introduce uh, George Garner, assistant director. He's been assistant director of the uh, Civil Rights Heritage Center for almost a decade now. And uh, here he is. Zig and zag. Yeah, yeah, zig and zag. <laughs> Wonderful, Andrew. Thank you so much. I'm serious thanks to all the students for being here today, and those watching online as well. I wanted to root our conversation tonight in a little bit about the space that we're having in Alba. Because um, we're doing what we're doing out of the former girls' changing room of the Engman Public Natatorium, the city of South Bend's first indoor municipal swimming pool. And it's that word public that we think about a lot. Um, who was given the ability to be called a part of that public? You know, I actually just had a group of second graders uh, come in a couple of weeks ago, and I asked them that question. When you think that word public, what do you mean? I know they had an answer to it, right? This was an easy answer for them, because they all said something along the lines of open for everyone. And yet grown adults couldn't figure that out. Because between 1922 and 1936, African-American people who had been part of that public since before there was a city, who had been a growing part of that public during the 1920s and beyond, were specifically and deliberately denied entry by people who look like me. And then beginning in 1936, it started segregating that day. So we asked the question, how then could it have been called public? What did it mean that one portion of that public, again, the portion that I belong to, specifically and deliberately denied the meaning of that word to include all human beings. That was an act of violence. And it impacted, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people out of this space for at least 30 years. What we do now is reclaim that space. The space was born from the actions, from the investigations, from the work done by IU South Bend students starting in 2000. We were formed on campus as a research wing of the history department with the express mission of studying local history. And the students who did that work uncovered much of the reality of the space, brought this story to light that hadn't been talked about openly, that hadn't been repeated for a very long time. So it's my distinct pleasure as we look at this challenge, as we look at the climate challenge in front of us, to again bring back IU South Bend students to do that work, to face that challenge. So thank you all for coming and thank you for participating. Thank you, George. Yeah, I appreciate George giving his insight and I appreciate that we're all as you know, IUSB students able to kind of take part in you know, reclaiming this space as a tool of education and as a tool of you know, progressing forward. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Krista Bailey uh, digitally, of course. We wish we could have you here, Krista, but we appreciate you being here. Thanks and good evening, everybody, and welcome to South Bend's Climate Teach-In. Um, I'm Chris Bailey. I'm the former director of the Center for a Sustainable Future at IU South Bend, and I'm currently adjunct professor, professor in the Sustainability Studies program. Uh, big thanks to Adrian uh, for the welcome and for facilitating the conversation this evening. Uh, he's a smart, charming, and creative person, so I know you're in good hands this evening. Uh, big thanks to George Garner for the welcome to this wonderful facility um, and for the tech help. He made it possible for this to be live streamed uh, and to be recorded for future viewing. And welcome to all of you who are joining in person and virtually to learn, to discuss, and importantly, to work together towards solutions, large and small, that we can all do and hopefully things we all will do. 
This event is part of the worldwide teaching on climate. And this is happening all over the planet, as Adrian mentioned. So you can see on the screen uh, this map of all the different places across the world where teachings have been happening throughout the day today and into the evening. Uh, there are more than 350 planned events taking place in more than 50 countries. So congratulations on being part of a global conversation today about climate solutions, climate justice, and problem solving. This event is hosted, of course, by the Civil Rights Heritage Center, um, but it's led by Sustainability Studies students. They're gonna be the ones sharing their information about climate impacts and talk with you about solutions we can do on personal, household, organizational, community, and, and even global levels. So that's, that's all for me, uh, because we have four emerging expert panelists who will talk through issues to inform and inspire you towards solutions. Yes, these are students, uh, most from a capstone course in their sustainability studies degree program. And each year in this class, they get the chance to speak and write publicly about sustainability. So this is their chance. Uh, and with that, I'm going to let them get things started. And I'll join you again when we start uh, talking about some informed solution actions we can take. Thank you so much, Krista. Uh, and as she said, we're going to begin our conversation with a third year sustainability student, uh, Corey Jones. She's going to offer a local perspective on climate issues. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. Food security is the access to healthy food that meets dietary needs and preferences for all people. Food security is also about the availability, access, utilization, and stability of safe and nutritious food. If any one of these components is broke, it is considered food insecurity. This is necessary for critical growth and development in both children and adults. Without food security, there is a much higher chance to develop chronic diseases and are more likely to have a shorter lifespan. South Bend is one of the many places across the United States that is currently battling with food security. There are currently 14 food pantries in South Bend alone, yet St. Joseph County has a food insecurity rate of 12.9%, which means that approximately 34,870 residents do not have access to fresh, healthy, or affordable food. Not only does food insecurity affect our health, but it also affects climate change. Climate change has evolved over decades from just a theory to a reality to a true emergency. South Bend has seen this evolution up close and in recent years, climate change has affected our economy, our public infrastructure and our neighborhood quality of life. In 2018, the Indiana Climate Change Impacts Assessment was completed by a collaborative of Indiana-based experts. This provided specific information on the impacts of climate change on South Bend. They concluded that there had been an increase in record-breaking heat waves and flooding from the St. Joseph River and other waterways as a result of increased heavy rainfall. There also has been a decrease in the productivity of corn and soybeans, a delayed fall freeze, which extends the ragweed allergy season. There are shorter winters, which increases the exposure to ticks and Lyme disease and many more. Food security ties into two aspects of the sustainable development goals. These goals are interlinked global goals designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. Goal number two, zero hunger, and goal number three, good health and well-being. Um, goal number two, end hunger, is highlighted to encourage and achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. There has been progress made toward increasing food security in South Bend, especially since the pandemic, and we are just beginning to realize how important it is and the effects of it all. Goal number three, good health and well-being, works to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being at all ages. This goal explains how, how living a healthy lifestyle is important for everyone, not just certain people. Not having food security at any stage in life, especially at a young stage, is crucial for your future health and well-being. COVID-19 not only wreaked havoc on our health, but also disrupted many supply chains, including, including food. Many kids relied on school lunches to provide them of their adequate nutrition, yet COVID had shut down schools. Many families in South Bend were unable to afford to feed their families because their jobs had also shut down. 
However, the city of South Bend teamed up to donate food to provide these families with adequate nutrition. It's been two years since COVID reached the United States, yet we are still dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic and are still fighting for a food secure future. Thank you so much, Corey. Appreciate your insight. And we'll be back around to ask you some questions because we've been thinking of some exciting things you brought up. Um, uh, to introduce uh, Stephanie Sword, she's a uh, graduate student pursuing a liberal studies degree with a certificate in uh, strategic sustainability planning. Um, and she's going to offer a regional perspective on food issues and climate. Thank you. I'm going to talk about regional Indiana food insecurity. Imagine you had just enough money to buy food for the week with nothing left over to pay your rent, utility bills, an unexpected illness, or bus fare to get to work. Many families throughout Indiana are facing this reality every day. In a country that wastes billions of pounds of food each year, it's almost shocking that anyone in America goes hungry. Yet every day, millions of children and adults do not get the meals they need to thrive. Hunger is a complex issue. When people face hunger, they often struggle to meet other basic needs as well, such as housing, employment, and healthcare. Though many of us may not realize the grave disparities that exist in our communities, People face hunger in every county and congressional district in Indiana. They could be our neighbors, kids in our children's classrooms, and the possibilities go on. In Indiana, approximately 835,000 people are facing hunger, and of them, approximately 240,000 are children. That's astounding. One in eight adults and one in seven children are faced with the reality of not having enough food to sustain a quality of life. The average cost of a meal in Indiana is $2.74, which accounts for a deficit of 400,000 to be able to feed every single person quality, healthy food throughout the state. COVID has increased food insecurity among families with children and communities of color who already faced hunger at a much higher rate before COVID. Every community throughout Indiana is home to families who face hunger, but rural communities are especially hard hit by hunger. Many households that experience food insecurity do not qualify for federal nutrition programs and visit their local food banks and other food programs for extra support. Hunger in African American, Latino, and Native American communities is higher because of systemic racial injustice. For people experiencing nutrition insecurity, climate change is a threat multiplier that worsens existing food access and affordability issues. Extreme weather events, extreme temperature variants, changes in precipitation, changing soil temperatures, and other climate impacts will affect crop yields. Climate impacts can also introduce interruptions in the current food processing and distribution system. Distributions that occur in the food system are likely to cause food availability of pricing fluctuations. The challenges that climate change presents to the broader food system while simultaneously supporting small businesses in the local economy. Studies have indicated that nearly 32 jobs are created for every 1 million in revenue generated by producers involved in local food market compared to only 10.5% jobs for those involved in wholesale channels exclusively. Healthy local food systems can also play a critical role in addressing food insecurity within neighborhoods of higher vulnerability. A robust local food system establishes additional supply chains and resilience to distribution breakdown, increasing overall community resilience. Climate change considerations and climate hazards to the local food and agricultural system include reduced crop quality and yield, vulnerability to pest and soil moisture, as well as fluctuation and availability, food price and change. People in low income neighborhoods may have limited access to full service supermarkets or grocery store areas known as food deserts. Studies have also shown that communities with fewer resources often have more outlets that promote unhealthy foods and little access to affordable, nutritious food, a condition known as a nutrition desert. To address the problem of hunger, we must first understand it. To accurately estimate the number of people who may be food insecure in Indiana, I analyzed the local data from US Census Bureau and Bureau of Labor Statistics on factors that research has shown to contribute to food insecurity. These factors include unemployment and poverty, as well as other demographic and household characteristics. In addition to measuring how pervasive the need is, the study also estimates the cost of a meal and the amount of need among people who are food insecure. Hunger and health are deeply connected. Healthy bodies and minds require nutritious meals at every age, but when people don't have enough food or have to choose inexpensive foods with low nutritional value, it can seriously impact their health. And once the cycle of poor diet and poor health begins, it can be hard to break, but simply hunger's toll can be life altering. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And uh, just handing off the mic to Jeremiah Salt. Uh, he's gonna offer some national data on hunger. Thank you. 
Climate change poses many dangers to food security for individuals within the United States. On March 17th, the U.S. Department of Commerce's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration released its U.S. Spring Outlook for 2022. It states that nearly 60% of the continental United States is currently facing drought conditions. The NOAA predicts that elevated temperatures will persist throughout the United States. Droughts will continue in the western and southern regions, while the Midwest and other regions will face an elevated chance of flooding events. Historic droughts have plagued the south and west coasts, while a myriad of hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and storms have devastated other agricultural regions throughout the United States in recent years. Climate change will lead to the loss of pollinator species, such as bees and butterflies, which are critical to food supply chains. Climate change will also lead to the loss of agricultural land and the loss of water. All of these conditions will drastically increase food insecurity in the United States. The conditions that contribute to and drive climate change are also the conditions that cause pandemics. Pandemics create many issues for food security. Deforestation and loss of habitat increases the probability of zoonic diseases. Increased air pollution also leaves people more susceptible to infection and spreading infections. Many people face food security issues throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of us witnessed the lines to food banks on the news and experienced the challenges of empty shelves while shopping. Pandemics create many barriers that prevent people from access to eating a wide variety of nutritious foods, leaving them food insecure. The relationship between climate change and food is indeed quite complicated. The USDA states that in 2020, 27.5 million households in the United States experienced some level of food insecurity. Simultaneously, 108 billion pounds of food is wasted annually in the United States, according to Feeding America. This means that nearly 40% of the food we produce winds up in landfills. This 108 billion pounds of food waste has the potential to provide an estimated 130 billion meals. EPA statistics highlight that food wasted in the United States produces 18% of total methane emissions emitted by the United States. As many of you know, Methane is a potent greenhouse gas that fuels climate change with 25 times the heat trapping ability of carbon dioxide. Reducing food waste and reducing food insecurity are two priorities that are synergistic in ways to combat climate change. I think that we can agree that we need to get as much of this food into Hungry Mouse long before it reaches the landfill. Food is also often tied to how we identify cultures all over the world. In the United States, we've established a wasteful food culture where social norms even sometimes demand direct wastage as a signal of good manners. Americans demand our food to be oversized, overprocessed, and undernutritious. We also demand that our food seem cheap while avoiding the true cost to our health and the environment. We desperately need to reestablish our relationship with food and redefine our cultural outlook towards food to combat climate change. We can shift our culture to appreciate the life cycle of food and promote good nutrition by empowering each other through sharing knowledge and showcasing examples. Combating climate change will take creative solutions that form from community connections. I encourage all of you to make that connection. I hope everyone has an inspired Earth Day. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. And we, uh, we appreciate you leaving on a positive and hopeful note. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Ruth Bonda. She's also a student in the sustainability major, and she's going to be offering a global perspective on hunger. All right. Uh, food insecurity in the sub-Saharan Africa. The sub-Saharan Africa is located on the southern part of the Sahara Desert. This means it consists of 46 countries out of the 54 countries in Africa. The population is about 1.1 or 1.14 billion inhabitants in sub-Saharan Africa. So let me start by defining what food security is. The Food Security Agri uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO of the United Nations, described the food security or in order to measure food insecurity in the sub-Saharan Africa, that food must be available, food must be accessible, and food must be uh, should have stability of supply 
The World, the World Food Summit that took place in 1996 uh, defined food security in sub-Saharan Africa that it should be physical and social, economically accessible, to be sufficient, safe, and nutritious to meet the dietary needs of the people in sub-Saharan Africa. That means food can be available, it can be accessed, it can also have a stability supply. But if this food is not safe and it's not nutritious, that means also the sub-Saharan Africa remains food insecure. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN in 2020 alone, 281 million Africans were undernourished. That means it was an increase of 89.1 million over 2014 report. That shows over six years we've had uh, an increase of more than 33% of food insecurity in Africa. I'll talk about agricultural production because this is the key to Africa's food production. Climate change is likely to uh, diminish, uh, to diminish continued progress of the food security through production disruption that leads to local availability limitations and prices that are being increased. So more than two thirds of the sub-Saharan Africa depends on rain-fed agriculture. 85% of the livelihoods rely on rain-fed agriculture. The total crop land is dominated by rain-fed agriculture is about 97% of the total crop production in the area around uh, um, along. In the sub-Saharan Africa, many countries are currently water stressed because of climate change is, pro is projected to increase. Irrigation itself only counts for three to four percent of the agricultural production. There has been a huge change in the global temperatures all over the world with an increase of over 7.74% uh, degrees Celsius in the last 100 years. Sub-Sahara Africa continues to have hot and dry weather, which is trending over the past 100 years. Since the 1960s, temperatures have been rising higher and higher in the African continent. The UN crop yield is estimated to decrease by 10% by 2050 as the greatest warming continues in Africa. Crops such as wheat are likely to decrease production by 10 to 20% by 2030 due to the changes in the temperatures alone. Changing in the pattern of rainfalls. The rainfalls also play a significant role to determine agricultural production. So there has been change in water and soil moisture over the past 100 years in the African continent. And this continues because of the high temperatures and less rainfall. The floods and droughts have caused food insecurity to increase by five to 20% uh, due to the floods and drought in Sub-Sahara Africa. Associated deterioration in health and children's schools attendance can worsen longer term and gender inequalities due to climate change. In 2020, there was an almost 40% increase in population that was affected by food insecurity compared to the previous year. There's also been displacement. An estimate of 12% of all new population displacement worldwide occurred in the Horn of Africa region alone, with over 1.2 million new disaster related displacement, which were recorded in Africa. The impact of drought in Africa is severe due to the backlog of infrastructure development. A study in my home country, Malawi itself, uh, emphasized vulnerability drought due to declining access of inputs and infrastructure as a result of population growth and high density population. A host of strategies have been considered as being effective against droughts, which include gender, age adaptivity to farming, race community, and involvement in government and traditional knowledge blended with scientific knowledge. If the African continent can increase its scientific knowledge to help fight against food insecurity, maybe perhaps uh, the gap uh, between food security and food secure can also be shortened. In conclusion, climate change will lead to change in yield and area growth in the sub-Saharan Africa, reduce the availability of uh, crops and also growing childhood malnutrition in sub-Saharan Africa continues to increase. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. And uh, I think that you brought up a very good point that 
and it's really only through awareness and education is that we're really going to we're going to be able to solve some of these issues and uh it's kind of easy to feel a bit discouraged after hearing some of these these problems that we're facing and i mean obviously they're they're in the news all the time but the the real purpose of this teaching on climate is to focus on solutions um and to use this information that our wonderful students have provided to us now to really begin that conversation as to what steps we can take uh as to solving these problems before us uh i guess i maybe just to to open it up to the floor and to open it up also to our, our viewers online and chris bailey as well um I, I think about what jeremiah brought up about uh, i mean the the immediate things that are within our power and our daily decisions to actually change our food culture you know, maybe away from processed foods, uh, away from, you know, things that are, are you know, meat being a, a high uh, methane producer, you know, the, the, the production of meat and the meat industry. I mean, so, you know, we can cut out red meat in our diets, but uh, I guess my question to you is, uh, what are some other things that we can do just in our in our day-to-day -day life to kind of shift that food culture away from waste? Yeah, and that's, and that's coming back and making that connection to the community. Um, a lot of people, maybe they're not... Um, sure that they know how to cook more nutritious food. So it's safer for them to stick with the macaroni and cheese. It's safer to stick with the ramen noodles because if they buy that bag of produce, um, they may not know how to cook it or that bag of apples might go bad in the refrigerator. Uh, the local community connections, getting people out in a uh, community garden, doing it together, building upon relationships uh, to the people that are near you, getting to know your neighbors. I think that's how we can all start to shift the culture. No, of course. And uh, we, we do have a, a community garden on IUSB campus. I think that's it's something that a lot of students maybe aren't aware of, but it's, I mean, exactly the kind of things that we need to be you know, making people aware of, you know, to, to know where your food come from, uh, comes from and to understand the impact that its production has. Um, and I, I know uh, both Stephanie and Corey kind of touched on on supply chain issues throughout the throughout the pandemic. Uh, I guess uh, I was wondering how you know that has been moving along now. I, I know maybe in the grocery stores we might feel like you know everything's back to normal, but uh, I mean, how else has uh, you know the, the pandemic and climate change been affecting supply chains at least uh, locally? You know, one way we can look at is uh, to collaborate with some of our local convenience stores throughout our communities um, and to incentivize purchase of local food that is affordable. So it's taking out that that part of it and, and going back to um, being a local sustainable food source um, here. And also we can look at promoting education campaigns to show people how to have um, organic food um, at both the institutional level as well as the individual or a couple of ideas that come to mind. So I do know a couple ways that South Bend is actually um, implementing some new ways to um, feed the city, I guess. Um, and one of the ways um, is that the city of South Bend has implemented pop-up markets, which help feature local farmers, food businesses, and community-based organizations to address food insecurity. Um, and some other future ideas and initiatives that they have created um, include just inclusive and sustainable food systems that is accessible to all the West Side residents by developing a healthy corner store program. And not only would this promote healthy living and lifestyles, but it would also support the use of uh, sustainable food systems as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to meet people where, you know, where they get their food, right? I mean, it's one thing to have, you know, fresh, vibrant foods available in some place, but even if you, if you can't, I guess, you know, walk there or if you, you know, maybe the bus doesn't take you there. I mean, it's, is it really accessible? So I, I think, you know, the corner stores and you know, meeting people locally is a great way to, to meet that. Um, and I guess I'd like to open up the, the floor for, you know, any questions, if there's any questions from the in-person audience or if we have anybody digitally. I have a question. If I could pop in, um, going to the other end of the table to, to Ruth, uh, I thought there was some really interesting connections that you made um, but then it also made me feel a little bit powerless about what was um, happening on a completely different continent. I remember growing up and hearing about you know, starving people in, in Africa, not China, like my mom heard about growing up, but and, and not really knowing what to do there either. What do you think could be our best action as individuals or maybe as a country um, to advocate for? Would it be 
working on supply chain issues there, trying to support those, or should it be um, working on climate issues to try to you know, mitigate our impact that's you know, leading to all these issues? What do you think our best step would be to do as individuals or a society? All right, thank you, Krista. Um, I feel like the first thing I think uh, that we can advocate for is also like to increase maybe the scientific knowledge and methods to move away from the traditional agricultural practices that have been acting as a major thing in Africa. I feel like with a growing population, we should focus on what the next years and decades uh, will hold on for us. I feel like with the methods that are being used as of now cannot meet or cannot be used to a growing population that will be there in the next 10 or 20 years. So if uh, we as students, we cannot advocate for those scientific knowledge, but that means we are looking forward for more funding in the African continent to come in forward. If I, if I could add something to that. There was actually a, a recent study in the news where they had looked at optimizing all of the agricultural land that uh, we currently have. And if we started to re, re, um, vitalize that and return it back to its natural state and planted our agriculture in other areas, then we could actually eliminate climate change as a problem. And as simple as that may sound on a scientific paper, it's those political boundaries, it's that private property that's gonna prevent that being something that could even be considered to have happen all at once. But along the way, like Ruth was saying, we can look at different ways that we can optimize uh, optimize agricultural regions and uh, do better planning going forward with where we grow our food. How do we get there? And it is still, it comes back to knowledge and it comes back to legislation. Um, a lot of our food security issues are gonna, our, our fastest remedy is government intervention, whether that's federal programs and lowering the bar so more people have access or, um, optimizing our agricultural regions around the world. Yeah. And I'd like to add um, just one more um, piece to that that I think sure. um, I'd like to put out there is that actively engaging frontline communities in planning, implementing education, research, and decision-making about potential climate change impacts and the development. So having leaders within the communities and having individuals that live within these communities have a say um, as to what's going on and, and knowing the real story behind it. Well, uh, and Jeremiah mentioned, I guess, optimizing our, our food production. And I, mean, I guess the, not only just the space that we use, but I mean, the amount of, of water, I mean, the, every, everything's a resource, right? Water, space, and power. Uh, so I guess, do you guys have any information and anybody in the group uh, on crops or I guess sustainable ways of farming that are, you know, what, what should we be doing? You know, should we be moving away from, you know, I, I mentioned meat already, you know, you know, the amount of space that you need for a cow to graze so you can get however much pounds of meat, but what are some more efficient foods to produce? Well, like to produce one pound of beef, it's something like 2,500 gallons of water, but to produce that same protein using insects or mealworms, you can do it with about one gallon of water. So it's also just shifting our ideas of how we look at food and, and looking at other options because we are gonna have a very large population increase. We're looking at over 10 billion people and we're gonna to have to feed them all. I know it might sound a little dystopian to think about, you know, eating insect proteins, but I, I think I could get over it. I, you know, Humans have evolved eating insect proteins. I think we've got a question. Time. So several of you mentioned um, food waste. There's this interesting dichotomy between food waste and people going hungry. So the question is, what are some of the solutions that you have um, at any of the levels that you were looking at about how to balance food waste and addressing hunger? Okay, so to start off in South Bend, there's a program called the Cultivate Food Rescue, um, and they actually de are devoted to organizing community resources to fight hunger and to reduce food waste in, food waste in South Bend. Um, and the owner says that their impact provides that uh, proves, sorry, that proves 
that food rescues like Cultivate can help feed kids and reduce food waste in other communities as well. Um, and just like a couple facts about how much they've actually done in South Bend since November, 2021, um, when they first started in 2017, they actually rescued their two millionth pound of food starting in 2017. Um, and they actually started a program called like the backpack program for kids. And they've turned 2 million pounds of rescue food into 1.6 million meals just in South Bend. I mean, it's easy to make a dent in the, in the, the billions and billions of pounds, right? I mean, a million might not seem like too much out of all that, but you know, moving in the right direction. Ruth, did you have anything to add? Yes, I just wanted to add on, uh, on something. This is something that Krista had mentioned before also, uh, I think, you know, one of our classes. Um, the crimson card monies that are actually put in the students, they usually, we use them for uh, food across the campus. Uh, when, when the year ends, all that money like just goes to waste. So I think she had suggested that they were looking for solutions whereby maybe there can be a program whereby all that money can be donated maybe to open up an organization on campus or something that can also help to fight food waste because that's money that can be used to fight food insecurity even within the campus or to use it within indiana so that those are some of the things and strategies that maybe can come on forward because we've seen like people can have more than 300, 500, even $800 in their money that was not being used. When the fourth semester comes, all that money is not going to be used because there'll be new money being put for them. And another way we can look at food waste is as another input. As compost, it can be fed to insects that can then be fed to chickens, that, that can be then fed to fish. There's other ways besides um, there's other ways to keep it out of the landfill without directly eating it as well. And then also being aware of our own personal food waste that we throw away. Um, there are food waste calculators that you can go and calculate how much you and your family are throwing away on a yearly basis. So it's important in, to be cognitive of what you're buying and that it just didn't get shoved back to the back of your refrigerator. And then you have a bag full of um, groceries to throw away after that. So being cognitive of what you buy um, on a, a weekly basis. So should I just Google food waste calculator? I, I, yeah, I, I can get that out to you. George, did we have any questions online? Yeah, I've got uh, one question online that I'm actually think of one too, but I'll start with the one online. Uh, this is from Sarah Greenwald, and Sarah's asking, have you seen creative ways that companies or other communities around the world have minimized plastic packaging in their food insecurity efforts? Is this a growing concern as many local free meal programs as well as school cafeterias have switched to single-use materials since the pandemic? That's a great question. I I don't know if you, you want me to hand it off to anybody here. Do you guys have any any comments? I think it's an excellent point. I have not came across anybody trying to directly address that issue on the wide scale. I don't know if anybody else has. I think in, in general, I, I have seen that that trend growing. Uh, I mean, just with the pandemic, I mean, maybe restaurants that are opting to serve, you know, everything in takeout containers or I mean, big box stores or, or even store, stores like, uh, you know, Trader Joe's that we think, you know, they're, they're very, you know, progressive in their way that they're, they're trying to provide fresh and organic foods, but a lot of those foods are still uh, processed and, you know, packaged in plastic. Um, so, I mean, plastic waste is I mean, just a, another way that we kind of, you know, keep feeding things into the landfill, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's just one more, one more way that it's related. All right. Uh, and George, you, you said you had a question too? Thinking of my own uh, uh, in my own uh, life, I mean, uh, 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 myself and as a result, and we have a, a teenager. When I think of the amount of pop parts uh, <laughs> that we eat and the amount of frozen pizza that we eat, um, it's significant. And it, other people have written about this. You know, the, the quality of the pop part that you get at, say, Trader Joe's really not insignificantly different. <laughs> So what I'm asking though is how much really does just the way we structure work in the United States impact what we're talking about? So we're looking at uh, particularly lower socioeconomic, often though not always communities of color, 
Um, you know, it's not necessarily a really more pushback against the ideas that people don't know how to cook uh, good food. People know how to cook good food. It's just that uh, you're working a minimum wage job and you have to have three of them to pay rent. The ability to, to focus on that in the midst of everything else is just it's so incredibly difficult. So let weight be held out. So how much does pushing back against or advocating for things like a $15 minimum wage and other changes and stuff to that play all of, everything that you brought up is an excellent point, and all of these contribute to the systematic conditions that lead to food insecurity. But one point that we didn't highlight on enough is that scheduling, it, it, it's all about access. If there are barriers that prevent you from access to nutritious food, then you are food insecure. So you could have all the money and a car and have a grocery store right down the street and not live in a food desert. But if you work third shift, 12, 13 hours a day, and, and you're, you can't get to the grocery store before you go to work or you can't buy nutritious food you have an access issue and that leads to different levels of food insecurity and i i mean i advocate for creating and enabling um communities uh meaningful and continuous participation in funding and adaptations to local food policy to have more of a voice to what we would like to see within our communities and also doing local um, neighborhood gardens or going in and showing people how to do a garden because it's something about going and pulling out your own healthy food from something that you grew. And so having that in part of it and then expanding local market hubs, um, which um, Corey had spoke about um, in efforts to increase community buy-in for equity and food security among the population, especially at our high risk individuals um, in that, um, don't necessarily have that opportunity and um, for food um, security. Corey, did you have anything to add on that or anybody else? All right. Uh, Krista, did you have any other questions for our, our panelists or if there are any other questions online, we will uh, kind of be remaining open to keep the discussion. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's other questions from our online viewers, but while they're writing, um, I did have questions. Um, for, let's see, I think Jeremiah was talking about some of the social norms associated with food waste, and maybe this has something to do with eating Pop-Tarts or not. <laughs> um, but when you were talking about, um, you know, we have these norms that encourage food waste, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, going to something at my parents' house, they had a party, enough food to feed everybody, you know, 10 meals, but we were there for one. Um, so food's going to get wasted, but they didn't want to look um, cheap or skimpy or not be providing enough for everyone. Um, and I, I think that's the norm that you were talking about. And man, I have tried to convince them to prepare less, um, but it's tough. What do you think we can do to start shifting these social norms on a, on, a, on a personal level in that like family and friend realm. Well, that's just a piece of it because we live in the nation of super size me. It's, it's, we have the big gatherings and we have the big events and we want everybody to have enough food. But at the same time, we have these, especially, you know, when it comes to gender and women where they feel like, oh, that they're going to be judged if they finish all the food on their plate, or um, it was acculturated that you leave a bit of food on your plate, you know, to show that you were satisfied as good manners. It's, it's all of these things that add to the, the food waste culture. I think so what I... can we do to start shifting that? I mean, if we want to leave with the solution, that's one that has been weighing on my mind. Uh, it's just how to, you know, let's not put out enough to feed an army. Let's just feed the 10 people that are here adequately, not stuff us all and send us home with piles of leftovers that will go to waste. <laughs> what can we- Hopefully, I, I think that raising awareness and um, the educational outreach piece of it and making the connection so that people start making the connection that this is the food that they're talking about. This is the food that's producing the methane because a lot of people are doing this as, as it's been acculturated, it's not noticed. It's invisible by design. There's also the things that, I mean, we, we just maybe don't have control over, right? I mean, in the supermarket, I mean, you imagine you know, all the, the best fruits that are, are put out, right? You know, it's the ones without the spots or without the bruises or, and I, I know maybe if you're, 
especially, I mean, or at least in the context of uh, IUSB's food bank, they kind of try to maybe subvert a lot of those things. I mean, you, you will see a lot of foods that maybe were intended to be wasted. I mean, you know, dented cans or, you know, packages that were maybe, you know, opened or torn uh, in a way. And so I, I think that that also kind of plays into just, you know, the, the culture that we have that, you know, oh, well, I mean, my food has to be a perfect clean box, you know, fruits have to be, you know, washed and polished and often even coated in, you know, certain waxes. Uh, uh, I mean, even just with the amount, you think about how, how big our, our fridges are, right? I mean, you can fit a lot of food in there. And if that fridge doesn't look full, then maybe you're going to go out and buy more food to fill it up. Uh, so I guess these are all things I kind of start to think about when I think about how we can shift our food culture. And, and it's uh, raising our children and acculturating new ideals and, and understanding and portions. You may have anything to add this. Um, this is just more on my own individual food waste journey. Um, I started use, utilizing a company that will ship the food directly to me um, once, a, once a week. Um, and since I've been doing that, we have um, ultimately gone to pretty much 0% food waste. So um, it's, it's making that initial like thought of, wow, I, my impact of the food waste personally has um, driven both my family now and my children to be more cognitive of it. And like what Jeremiah was saying, it's just that education and learning. And hopefully everyone I talk to, I spread about this company and I'm like, wow, look, there's zero food waste. And it's just that little ripple of hopefully that will catch on. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Krista or George, or Deb, you said we had a question? Uh, so we actually had a question for Ruth. I was curious no, actually, it's different. Uh, I was also shocked when I got to the U.S. to learn that 40% of U.S. food goes to West. That's so shocking because um, it's it's not the same. We make sure that when we cook our food, we have to finish it. Of course, sometimes we can have leftovers, but that food is going to be eaten. Well, USA, I've seen like food just being trashed. And I've asked uh, one restaurant before, like, why don't you take maybe um, the remaining food maybe to a home, homeless uh, place and stuff. But they said uh, there's too much lawsuits in the USA. So sometimes they're scared, like they have uh, leftovers, they can take it to a place and somebody can get sick. So it means uh, lawsuits are waiting for you. So they just prefer to trash food in that way. And I've definitely experienced that too. I mean, I've worked in you know places that serve baked goods. And I mean, sometimes even, even for employees, you know, employees would, could get you know, in, in trouble if they tried to bring home, you know, extra wasted food and it's a, it had to be, you know, cataloged or I guess accounted for within, you know, whatever they're, they're budgeting. And I, maybe a lot of it does kind of lead back to, uh, I guess, needing to profit off of that food instead of being able to, you know, like you said, hand it off to a local food bank or homeless shelter, you know, because maybe then there, there wouldn't be any listed profit in that. So I guess that's, you know, an issue not, not only with our food culture, but I guess our, you know, economic culture here as well. Great question. Thank you so much. George, did we have any other questions online? Not seeing any other online. All right. Krista, did you have any other questions or closing remarks? I didn't, but I did just post online, if people didn't see the chat, um, about looking for solutions. I'd love to hear um, across the panel, um, you've all shared kind of a different perspective, a, a local, a regional, national, global, uh, what's happening in terms of, of climate change and the impact that has on our food. So what can we do, right? We, we've learned a lot that's been um, sobering, and uh, but we don't want to leave on that note. Uh, so let's, uh, if we could shift towards solutions, um, what is something that each of you, given what you've learned um, in preparing for this teaching, um, or maybe something you already knew or trying to do, um, I know Stephanie was talking about shifts she's made, um, what can we do? What's something that, that you think you can and will do, not just theoretically, but actually will be able to, to do in response to these issues? Um, so maybe if we could hear from everyone on that panel and maybe Adrian too, because it sounds like he's been thinking about this. Um, and I'll watch for other ideas coming up uh, on the chat. All right, anybody, anybody want to volunteer to start us off or? Yeah, I Bruce? can start. Um, for me, I feel like um, the first solution should also come to me as an individual. Like, 
I have to mind what do I buy in my house? How much food waste do I have? I mean, it's shocking as an individual to see how much food waste you have in your household, yet we're talking about food waste or food insecurities. Um, I, give, I think I once gave an example in class. Think about the bananas you buy, the fruits and the vegetables. When you purchase those, what percentage goes to waste? You'll be shocked that even you are wasting more than 30% of what you've bought. So maybe sometimes you have to reduce of what you're buying in a week or within two weeks in order to also reduce food waste within your household. Absolutely. And it, within my household, we've, we've had the cut down on our shopping and we've had to be more responsible with our shopping, but we also cook uh, proportionately. I have a family of five at home and we don't really do leftovers. We don't have leftovers. We don't scrape a lot in the trash and my kids are raised to, to finish food. Food's not all about pleasure. It's about getting and gaining nutrition and um, not overwhelming them with portion sizes. So that personally has reduced the amount of food wasted, but then also cutting down on uh, the food that you put into the trash. When you start composting and you start keeping track of what you're wasting, you start actually seeing your money in that bucket, you know, and you can only imagine how much you've sent off to the landfill over time. Thank you. Um, some other um, things that I have done um, personally, but I also advocate to is support your businesses such as restaurants that use locally grown food. Um, you're not going to have as much food waste um, through uh, transportation, um, the water, everything that goes into that. Um, support the local farmer's market also um, by ethically harvested grown food um, and by um, in season fruits and vegetables. Um, and that goes to minimizing the distance and um, again, to, for the food to get there, but being cognitive of what you're putting on your plate or what is going in your refrigerator, because it does kind of hide back there. And then you're like, oh, 10, 10 Tupperware dishes. So it's just being aware of what you're buying also. Um, so personally with my family, I was very blessed to have a very open-minded yet traditional family. Um, so we do do a lot of gardening. We grow a lot of our own food. Um, and not a lot of that goes to waste, barely any of it, actually. Um, if any of the food that we grow goes bad, we just turn it into something else. Um, so uh, tomatoes, for example, if the tomatoes go bad and we can't cook them anymore, then we turn them into salsa and then we all eat that or we turn it into to tomato juice. Um, but basically everything that we grow gets used sooner or later. Uh, we can freeze stuff to save it for later. Um, I personally don't buy groceries just because I am still young and I am uh, learning more about um, how in the future I'm going to be raising my family. Um, like Jeremiah said, that's how he raises his children and that's how I plan to raise mine too. So. No, and that, that's great that you guys, I mean, are, are not only involved in, I mean, the process of, of making your food, but that you're, you know, you see it all the way through that you're not actually wasting anything. I think that's something that I mean, a lot of people that kind of grow food, they're, they're more compelled to, to want to share that with everybody, right? I mean, so if we have too many carrots, you know, why would we throw them away and give some to the neighbor? Um, I think, uh, and you, you mentioned not really uh, doing your, your own grocery shopping yet, and I, but I can understand how, uh, I guess that's, I don't know, that that's a development where, you know, there's a lot of things to consider in the grocery store. I, I don't know, there's the packaged food might be cheaper than the unpackaged food, or I, I don't know, I, I try to bring my own uh, you know, canvas bags to be able to pack, you know, just the amount of food that I need. I mean, if I, under, if I know that I'm only going to need a couple potatoes for this, you know, this recipe, and I'm probably not going to, you know, need more potatoes for a couple of days, you know, and potatoes do last a long while. Though, uh, Jeremiah, did you have something to add? Yeah. Um, another thing I did want to add is one thing that we've realized while we were studying uh, sustainability issues in South Bend and looking at how to shape our community project for the semester is we looked at how many people were relying on the food bank, especially through the pandemic. It was nearly a million meals that got delivered through different partners. And that's when we realized that the donations that go to food banks are typically not the most nutritious items. And that's why we've been promoting for the week of Earth Day, we'll be accepting donations and we'll be providing a list of healthier donations that people can um, give to food banks so that needy people don't have to choose just between the ramen noodles and spaghetti sauce. Well, it's hard to meet that kind of demand, right? I mean, uh, perishable foods, I mean, maybe they don't last a while or, 
right, it is easier to, to donate canned goods, but I, I guess it's uh, you know, not to discount the quality of a, of a lot of canned foods. I think maybe a lot of people have that in their minds that you know canned maybe fruits and vegetables are often less nutritious than you know their fresh counterparts, but they can oftentimes be you know just as if not more nutritious. You know they can be canned or frozen at the peak of their you know their ripeness. So I've, and I, I think that that always is kind of comforting for me to know that you know even if you know, I'm running out of fresh food on the table, I would probably have you know bag of frozen uh, broccoli or frozen peas or something in the freezer that you know could provide a lot of you know, good nutrition uh, nutrition for my meal. So there is a comment in the chat that I'd like to read a couple of them. Uh, Sarah writes uh, in terms of her solutions, I've tried to be more intentional about meal planning and also putting things in the freezer uh, for future use like brown bananas or leftover soup. So instead of just getting rid of it, um, I think similar to what Corey was talking about, like, hey, it's still left, but we're not going to eat it like this. Let's turn it into something else, save it for later, figure out what to do with it. So that's a cool idea, Sarah. And building, and building your community connections and getting to know your neighbors. Hey, if you got some extra, maybe you could share it with them. Maybe it'll be something that they want to cook later. Yeah, if you don't want to make banana bread, <laughs> your neighbors might. <laughs> I know I've done that. <laughs> Or your better uh, wash cookies. There's another interesting solution uh, posted from Monica. She says there is a food not bombs group here in South Bend. Uh, food uh, not bombs is a community activist group based around mutual aid to assist food insecure people of South Bend. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, they aim to work with the community to best feed those affected by homelessness, natural disasters, and those in food deserts. Um, and you can find the group on Facebook and on Instagram. So Food Not Bombs of South Bend uh, might be a great thing to get involved with if we want to work towards solutions in our area. I'm, I'm also getting hungry right now. So if there's any food out there <laughs> that's getting wasted, I will come eat it. <laughs> There is another question in the chat. I don't want to overlook that either from Robert. Um, it says, great work, first of all. Uh, what can Thank be you, done Robert. to reduce food deserts and the effects of climate change on those? Well, what you would typically see at Food Desert is from a, typically like a lower um, socioeconomic community. So with us having the community be part and have a voice and having educational, nutritional, nutrition, um, uh, let's see, cooking um, classes and whatnot, we have the ability to uh, bring that awareness so we can start working on that. Um, and we also need to be cognitive that sometimes that those the convenience stores that are in within those locations are don't really have any healthy food choices. So by bringing awareness that people don't have the capability to get to um, good healthy food is a uh, step one, I, I believe. Um, and from that, it can then build from, well, how do we start that community garden? How do we get um, healthy food in here? It's, it's bringing that awareness that um, there's more than just the local food desert. Food, food deserts are when the you don't have access to a grocery store within your neighborhood. And as we face increasing um, weather conditions, that's going to be the kind of thing that prevents access. You know, if there's a major storm and a flood outside, that's not going to help anybody get to the grocery store any easier. So how do we address that? We have to, we have to be in the communities. We have to try to bring food to people and to places that they can access it. I think Stephanie was talking something about healthy healthy corner stores, and Corey had mentioned some some pop up markets in places that maybe are food deserts. So um, supporting those so they stay there and they don't say, "Well, we tried it and no one bought it." Um, you know, seeking them out and, and supporting them might be a great solution too. Local leaders, community organizations, church groups. 
we we have a lot of um of those in South Bend that, that work within the communities and try to alleviate some of the stress of food deserts as well. Ruth, did you have anything to add? No. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Krista, I don't know if you had any other uh, closing remarks or had other questions from the audience. Uh, just that I hope some of these solutions have, um, I know I've got some new ideas, which I'm delighted about, um, that I hope everyone's leaving with not just a little more knowledge to help raise awareness, because that's definitely part of the solution. I think I heard that from everybody uh, in the room today, is to share what you know uh, and raise awareness uh, and keep talking about it. Uh, that is definitely an important first step because no one's gonna change what they're doing if they don't know why it's important to do so. Uh, so thank you all for sharing the information with us and to get us, help us think about solutions. Uh, and thanks to the, uh, the audience in person and virtual for sharing some ideas and questions and solutions. Um, definitely some great food for thought, so. And uh, definitely a big thanks to uh, George Garner and the uh, Civil Rights Heritage Center for hosting this event. Um, and we, uh, we appreciate, you know, Krista joining us online. Uh, we appreciate all of our, our student guests, uh, Corey Jones and Stephanie Sword, uh, Jeremiah Salt and Ruth Bonda. Uh, if there are any other questions for them, I'm sure they'd be uh, happy to answer. But uh, if not, we, we appreciate your time and we appreciate everybody for coming out to our worldwide teaching on climate. Thank you.